Hello Year 12 Psychologists, I hope that you are all well and keeping safe. And this lesson we are going to focus on making links between your study of psychology and the current coronavirus pandemic which we are all living in. And I'm sure that perhaps when you've been watching the news or scrolling through um, social media, you would have been able to make some links between what you've studied in psychology um, and our current situation. But I want us to be a little bit more intentional about that. One of the most important skills that we can develop as psychologists is to make constant links between theory and our present day. And what you're going to find is that we're going to go through the different topics that you've covered in psychology so far and draw out the links that we can make between those topics and the coronavirus. It might be that we're using these topics to explain um, human behaviours that we've observed um, during this situation. At the end of this PowerPoint, I would like you to write 300 to 600 words um, explaining the link that you've made, ensuring that you're using specialist terminology and your accounts are going to be used for the school newsletter. And that will be a fabulous way to show your knowledge of psychology and show the true psychologist that you all are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through a number of topics that we have covered in psychology and you will choose an area to focus on and you would perhaps want to choose a, a sub area within the overall topic. So, for example, for social influence, you might want to narrow it down into the types of conformity, for example. And like I said, you're going to write 300 to 600 words explaining the link between that chosen topic area and the coronavirus pandemic. You must ensure that within your write-up, you're using specialist terminology. You're referring to key pieces of research where appropriate and also referring to key researchers. And I want you to make sure that you have contextualised your answer. By contextualised, I mean that if you've written a, an account without referring to the coronavirus at all, then you really haven't followed the, the brief that I've given for this particular assignment. So make sure that indeed you are making those links to the present context. And that's what I mean by contextualise. So we start off with social influence. Now, social influence, you've, we've covered so many topics within social influence, and I've listed some here just to name a few. And when I think about social influence and the coronavirus, I think this whole idea of social distancing. We can see here where people are queuing. We can see here where someone's giving space to their neighbour. And oftentimes, it might be, uh, there might be a situation where someone goes um, to join a queue, but the reason they start queuing is because they see everyone else doing it, yeah? And we could use that as an example of conformity. So perhaps they are complying to the, the group pressure that is around them. Another example might be the fact that it's obedience to authority. So it could simply be that people are obeying the rules of social distancing because of the legitimate authority. And we know that authority is legitimate if you can see that they're wearing a uniform, like here, in the police, with the police officer. But then you might say this situation also explains resistance to social influence. So you've got someone here who is sitting down. We're not supposed to be sitting down when it comes to um, social distancing. And when we go out to exercise, Boris certainly did not say that we should have picnics and sunbathe. So why is it that some people feel like they can resist social influence? You might want to make connections such as perhaps the presence of social support, the presence of an ally. Or you might even bring in approaches and say, well, it's um, social learning theory. They've seen other people do it and they've gotten away with it. Therefore, they felt vicariously reinforced to do the same. You can take your pick. So we come on to our next topic, which is attachment. And within attachment, we covered a range of areas, including caregiver infant interactions, stages of attachment, types of attachment, cultural variations in attachment, and so on. I've been able to make a link between the current situation and um, attachment theory. So have a look at these grandparents who are interacting with their grandchildren through a glass door. And this is, of course, due to social distancing and their age as well, because they are not allowed to interact even with their own family. It might be the case that within this coronavirus pandemic, there will be a lot of infants, children, um, young adults who are unable to form multiple attachments with their grandparents. Um, with their aunties and uncles and cousins and so on and think about what consequences that might have for their later development so that's one link between attachment specifically the stages of attachment and the multiple attachments which is the final stage um, in Shafrin Emerson's stages of attachment theory you also might want to make a link between maternal deprivation 
and the coronavirus pandemic. It could be that, unfortunately, due to sickness, infants or children are separated from their primary caregiver, either their mother or their father. And we know that separation, early separation within the critical period can lead to multiple consequences. And remember our handy acronym, which is the ADIDAS acronym with four Ds. Remember the multiple um, maladaptive consequences that can be a result of separation, such as aggression, delinquency, um, intellectual retardation. And this might make you think, well, how might the coronavirus pandemic influence um, attachment types and attachment styles in their later life. If children haven't been able to form strong bonds during this time, it could be that later on down the line, we have a rise um, in issues of bullying, perhaps their romantic relationships aren't able to be sustained. And then lastly, on a positive note, we might say that the current situation really does challenge the learning theory of attachment. The learning theory of attachment says that we attach because of food. However, in this situation, we might find that there are many children who are at home, stuck with their parents, who are no longer attaching to their parents because their parents are the ones who provide for them, but perhaps because their parents are now the ones who are homeschooling them. And perhaps you might argue that there are uh, multiple layers to attachment. And then we come on to the topic of memory. And I know that you've done this with Miss Smith or you're currently studying it with Miss Smith. When I think about memory, I think about the slogans that we have seen during the coronavirus pandemic. And we've got this slogan, stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. And then there's a leaked version of the, the upcoming slogan, which Boris is due to announce um, later on today because I'm recording this on a Sunday. Um, which is stay alert, control the virus and save lives. And I want you to think back in memory. George Miller came up with the magic number and the magic number describes the capacity of short-term memory. His argument and his research was that um, studies have shown that our short-term memory can hold seven plus or minus two items. Therefore, when you look at slogans, slogans will rarely have more than five to nine words in them. So if we count the words, that are in the, the main slogan that all of us know, stay at home. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven items exactly. Yeah. Another thing is NHS. NHS stands for the National Health Service. The fact that it has been chunked is also an example of memory because it's been chunked altogether. We are better able to retain it in our long term memory. And then lastly, the procedural memory of washing your hands and singing happy birthday and saying the Lord's Prayer, that is, again, to ingrain it in your long-term memory and make it a meaningful experience. And then for biopsychology, so the main link that I've made for biopsychology is the effect that the coronavirus is having on our sleep. Because perhaps we are not in our normal routines. It means that our sleep-wake cycle has certainly been affected. It means that our exogenous zeitgebers and endogenous pacemakers perhaps are not functioning as normal. You might wanna challenge yourself and think, actually, has my sleeping pattern changed since the lockdown? And you know what additional exogenous zeitgebers are influencing my ability to sleep on time or my ability to wake up on time. And remember that your exogenous light gapers are primarily light, but in this situation, it might be that you're exposed more to your phone, to your laptop, um, to your iPad, and therefore they could also act as an exogenous light gaper. So within psychopathology, you can make multiple links between your study of psychopathology within psychology and the coronavirus. We know for a fact that OCD, phobias and depression are the most prevalent mental disorders, but also they are certainly on the rise within this pandemic. If you think about the emotional and the behavioural and cognitive characteristics of each of these disorders, we can certainly understand why OCD may be on the rise within this um, coronavirus pandemic. Because it's a virus, of course, those who have OCD for germs, um, perhaps they would be having a much more difficult experience within this time. In terms of depression, we know that depression can come as a result of an activating event, which could be the onset of this um, lockdown situation and the um, coronavirus pandemic. And then there's the beliefs that one has about the event. So, oh, this is going to happen for the rest of our lives. And then the consequences that follow. So that's 
Albert Ellis's ABC model. Um, and then what you could do, perhaps if you decide to pick on um, depression as an example, you could perhaps provide some suggestions of how we can treat those who are suffering from depression within this time using the means that we have available. And if you do suggest CBT, well, think about and perhaps do some research on um, cognitive behavioural therapy that is offered online during this coronavirus pandemic. And then finally, for phobias, well, we know that phobias can be learnt and it could be that in this situation people are now learning new fears so they're learning to fear germs they're learning to fear the unseen and you might want to pick on that to expand on within approaches you could make strong links between um, the coronavirus pandemic and psychology and i've made multiple links here using these images so social learning theory is one we learn vicariously we learn through observing those around us and perhaps seeing them be rewarded for their behaviors so in terms of social distancing you're seeing other people um, social distance they're being rewarded in that they're not getting the virus quote unquote and therefore you are more inclined to imitate that behavior Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So <laughs> I've put in a small adjustment to Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It could be that indeed we start off first through <laughs> by desiring toilet paper. Um, and this is a very interesting one because I remember when the lockdown was first introduced and even prior to the lockdown, I was a bit bewildered by the number of people who were um, purchasing toilet paper. And I kid you not, there would be some people within the group of those who are um, buying excess toilet paper who were just doing it because everyone else was. Um, and that's an example of conformity in that situation. But of course, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs falls under the humanistic approach. And we've got quarantine um, hierarchy of needs. So you can see how perhaps Maslow's hierarchy of needs may lack temporal validity. It may have certainly gone through some adjustments um, due to the 2020 <laughs> situation that we are in. And then finally, for the behaviourist approach, so we can see here a poster um, um, coming from a police department. And the behaviourist approach argues that indeed we learn behaviours through punishment and rewards. And in terms of enforcing social distancing, the punishment here is that you receive a fine for your offence if you fail to social distance and it increases and, and it increases and so on. So you might say that um, punishment, which derives from our understanding of the behaviourist approach to behaviour, has been used in order to enforce social distancing rules. And that's you making a link between psychology and the coronavirus. And then finally for research methods, so think about what aspects of research methods have you observed during this coronavirus pandemic? And like I said, this topic we are going to explore um, after you complete this lesson, you complete this task. If we think about the fact that they are getting ready to conduct um, additional vaccine trials, of course they're looking for a vaccine for the coronavirus, this will entail having an experimental design. And you might want to do some forward research about what is an experimental design in psychology and how might these drug trials, these vaccine trials um, be run in order to get the best result. Would they be using a placebo? Would they have different groups of participants? Will their sample be representative? You know, one thing that I've been researching recently and I've been listening to a book called Invisible Women and I've just finished it. And it talks about the gender data gap. And one of the chapters focused on how many drug trials fail to include women in their sample. And therefore, there are lots of medications which work well in men, but they are not um, well attuned for women. They don't take into consideration the fact that women undergo multiple hormonal changes within a month. And therefore, hormones can actually affect the way we metabolize drugs. So that's just one example. It might be that within these vaccine trials, there's not enough representation of women. There's not enough representation of people of color as well. That's another thing because research has now shown that um, more black and ethnic minorities are more likely to die as a result of contracting the virus. But that's just, that's just a side note. Um, temporal validity, we might say the coronavirus is very recent. All the research that's coming out is very recent. Therefore, it's high in temporal validity. What does that mean? What are the strengths? You might want to write a little something about that. Think about the way data has been presented to us um, in the media, on the news and so on. 
they've been using graphs, they've been using pie charts, um, and that will get you thinking in terms of in psychology, the way we present data is super important because essentially you're presenting data for an audience, you're presenting data for them to understand it in the best way possible. And then finally, think about ethical issues. You know, the coronavirus is a socially sensitive um, area because indeed people have died and people unfortunately um, will continue to die from the virus. And it's really, really, really important that for you as a psychologist, you're able to recognise that, yes, it is a socially sensitive piece um, of research that people are engaging in. Indeed, within the trials and the, the drug vaccine um, trials and investigations, people must be given the right to withdraw. They must be protected from harm. They must be given informed consent and so on. And you might want to write something about that. So just to summarise the task, remember that you need to write 300 to 600 words explaining your chosen link between psychology and the coronavirus. You must include the following, so you must use specialist terminology, refer to key pieces of research and or researchers, contextualise your answer, so don't give me an answer summarising the social learning theory without making a single link to the coronavirus. That's rude. Make sure you actually contextualise your answer and get into this whole, um, this flow of making links between psychology and the real world. And maybe tell someone at home about what you've been doing. I want you to submit this to me via sharing my homework or you can submit it via email, but I prefer sharing my homework as I can download everyone's work um, into a zip folder. So make my life easier and do it by sharing my homework if you are able to. In terms of the methods that you can, or the type of presentation that you can use, you can either do it in a Word document, um, use a PowerPoint, or you can make a poster. It's up to you. Um, but ensure that, again, you've met the assignment brief. It's very short, 300 to 600 words. And if you do go over, it's no biggie, but just make sure that you are answering the question. And just a final note, make sure that you are proud of yourself, like you've come so far, we've been engaging in this online learning and it's not easy. Um, and I do do celebrate the fact that you've engaged um, with learning so well. And yeah, I just hope that all of you are safe and continue to remember that excellence is the norm, it's the standard. We do not do mediocre because guess what? After year 12 is year 13. And right now you are laying the foundation for year 13. Um, we don't want to get into a place where we are complacent. We don't want to get into a place where we think, oh, the examination boards are going to be lenient on us for next year. No, no, no. We don't even want them to be lenient. We want them to actually maintain the standard of excellence because I know that you guys will show up and you will show out so please continue in excellence continue to do the work continue to submit it on time and if you have any questions please make sure that you let myself or miss smith know and um, we are available to help i've been answering questions um, by sending voice notes because i find it easier to send a voice note sometimes um, but yeah god bless you and i'm looking forward to receiving your 300 to 600 word pieces